Ken Lum, the uh, great Canadian artist, joins us now. Ken, how are you? Very good. It's nice to see you again. Well, nice as to I see said, you. I, as I said, I think I prefer to be uh, north of the border right now. Well, I think we'd prefer to have you north of the border, Ken. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, it's an interesting time to talk to you because you've been focused around questions around monuments, around public art for a long time now, both as an artist and through your work with Monument Lab. You know, the pressure around statues and around monuments has been building for years, but definitely got to a breaking point in the past few months after the killing of George Floyd. And so what has it been like for you to starting off to see monuments come down and to see others become the, the focal point of protests? Well, first of all, uh, I started uh, with uh, Paul Farber, my colleague at the University of Pennsylvania, Monument Lab in 2012. When we started it, we actually thought we were late to the conversation. We were very interested in um, analyzing monuments for what they express and for what they oppress or suppress. And so, and the voices that are, are not heard because uh, other voices are uh, dominate in terms, of the, uh, in terms of the narrative. And so, um, you know, what's happened now is that Monument Lab is front and center. And, uh, you know, we, we, I've been incre- we've been incredibly busy. This morning, I had one our um, conversation with the Chicago Tribune writer. Yesterday, it was with New York, or last week it was New Yorker, and yesterday it was with Los Angeles Times. And it's been going like that for uh, several months now. How about you personally? I mean, I know in Philadelphia, the statue of Mayor Ritza was was taken down. Um, have there been moments that you've seen, like, and can you cite an example that's been particularly meaningful to you of a statue being taken down? Well, I think r- locally, Rizzo is really a very important one to be taken down. Um, I, the, but, you know, I, I, I don't want to uh, convey the sense that, you know, taking down the statue somehow somehow uh, s- stops the problem, right? The, prob- the problem is, is, is long-term. The problem is a dialogue. It may quell a certain... And, uh, you know, desire among p- certain people who want certain statues to come down, but that doesn't mean that the problem of, of endemic racism is, is resolved. But certainly that one is a, is a, it was very meaningful locally. Well, I, I'm glad you brought that up. Why exactly have monuments become such a focal point in the protests against police brutality, against white supremacy? I mean, I think in a certain sense, it's a little bit low hanging fruit because it's very present. And people don't understand. People understand uh, innately that monuments stand symbolically for a whole narrative uh, stream of, um, of unfairness, of social injustice, of uh, of racism, and so on. So they fairly un- unfairly they see these as important markers and symbols that encapsulate uh, a lot of the anxieties and, and frustrations and. Uh, uh, that people are feeling at the moment. So what do you think we're saying when we when we tear down a monument, when we when we take down a monument? Well, I think there, I think you have to break up that question. First of all, taking down a monument, as I said, uh, may satisfy a kind of short term uh, urge among certain parties that you know to, to, and and sometimes I think that's important because it's a symbolic release of uh, energy that 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 uh, produces. But I also think that uh, it's important that before a monument is ever taken down, that there be some interregnum that allows for critical dialogue and critical responses, particularly responses by artists, by intellectuals, by creative uh, practitioners, and so on. So I can cite the uh, example of uh, uh, Mayor uh, uh, Rizzo in Philadelphia. You know, the, over the years, his statue was yarn bombed. Uh, someone knitted a, uh, a hot pink uh, bikini and placed it uh, around uh, his torso and, and, and breast. And it was funny, and people would pose pictures w- with it uh, and so on. That's a kind of critical dialogue, which I think is, is not simply playful, but also, also very uh, deconstructive. And um, so I think that kind of dialogue needs to be part and parcel of something before we even start uh, the action of removal. Let's go to the flip side of that for a second. I mean, you have the president of the United States offering some pretty harsh penalties for for taking down statues, for destroying um, destroying monuments. Why why do you think people are um, so why is it so important for people that um, these monuments remain in place? Well, I think for a lot of people, it represents monuments. So. Monuments don't just represent what they uh, what they depict, right? They could represent even if someone doesn't really know anything about the history of of the uh, representation, 
they feel an attachment to it simply because it's it becomes habit. They they go downtown, they see the statue, they have no idea it's about a sl- slave trader or what that, what have you, mm-hmm. and they go, oh, let's meet under this. that's where I met my wife or that's where I met my partner or that's and so on, and so it becomes ingrained as part of the as part of uh, one's nature. And when when it becomes removed, then it becomes a kind of a shock to the system, and people, uh, you know, are innately conservative, not necessarily ideologically, but I- conservative in terms of uh, uh, in terms of you know the question of radical change in one's social environment. But but isn't it? Couldn't it also be along the lines of if if this person represents my history, and you take this down, are you telling me that my history is wrong? Are you telling me that? And then do I, do I have to then deal with the loss of power that comes part and parcel with that? Uh, yeah, but I, but but I think uh, that's the. I mean, it's vex. It's 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 messy, right? History, first of all, is very messy, right? I mean, take the example of uh, Christopher Columbus. That's a very messy one. If you go back to the 1950s and earlier, maybe even to the 1960s, you know, Italian Americans uh, face their own kind of uh, you know uh, racism, bigotry against Italian Americans. They were seen as somewhat less than white and. And so Christopher Columbus was this kind of unifying figure uh, with uh, Italian Americans entering into uh, mainstream acceptance, you might say, right? Because it was a, it was a, the narrative w- w- was was an accommodation of, of the greatness of Italians and so on, right? But the fact is, is that to you know go further in terms of Columbus, he was uh, you know he he brought slavery almost immediately. In fact, by the second visit to the uh, West Indies, he brought slavery, 400 were enslaved. Uh, he was a, a very avaricious person. He was sponsored by uh, uh, Ferdinand and Isabella of Spain, who also brought their own type of brutality in the name of under of the uh, Spanish Inquisition. So, you know, I think it's important for people to start digging and finding out about all, all these uh, all these histories that, that come attached with something. So speaking of history, when it's a particularly noxious history, you know, when you look at a Confederate statue, when you look at the history of slavery that's implied in that statue, it might even be a statue of someone who owned slaves. It might be a statue in the case in Nashville of someone who was a member of the Ku Klux Klan. There are still those who say by keeping those statues up, we are at least acknowledging our history. And by taking them down, we are denying even the poor parts of our history. You know, what do you make of that argument? It depends on the uh, statue. For example, a lot of the Confederate monuments were put up by the Daughters of the Confederacy to propagate a myth called the Lost Cause, that that, um, the Southern culture wasn't premised on slavery, but on a different type of gentility that and and, uh, um, African Americans were treated very nicely, in fact, better than the conditions that they find themselves in the general society uh, today and so on. So and that was all kind of a, a, a revisionism in terms of in terms of the actual history of slavery and the brutality and trauma of slavery that was visited upon black bodies, right? And they, and m- most most of the uh, statues that were sponsored by the uh, ancestors of the of Confederate soldiers, they were put up uh, during moments where there was actually progress in terms of civil liberties and and, uh, and equal rights. And so it was actually seen that it was actually a countervailing force w- w- at the moments when they were implemented moreover they were implemented in the really like 50 years after the end of the civil war and in place and they wanted to have uh, uh confederate monuments uh placed in all 50 states now i'm not a great uh you know follower of american history but i, I, but I don't think they the civil war extended to montana or alaska right or arizona and so and yet, there's a there's a Confederate monument in Arizona, and there there are there was or maybe, uh, plans for one to be placed in Montana. I, I want to talk. I think there, I think there's yeah. a distinction to be made in terms of uh, you know the types of uh, monuments and whether they really represent something or not. I, I want to talk about the great work Monument Lab is doing, and I want to talk a little bit about um, more about this moment. But just one final point on this in terms of the arguments I'm I'm seeing online. Another is that these are. Um, artworks and even if they're even if they're taken down perhaps they should be put somewhere else because they should at least be recognized as the work of art done by the sculptor at the time what what do you make of that argument well most of these uh, statue if you're talking about the Robert E Lee statue in Richmond Virginia or Stonewall Jackson or any of these monuments they're not 
they're not very distinguished works of art, if that's what you mean. I mean, they're basically dime a dozen types of uh, prosaic renderings and so on. There's nothing really quite sterling about it. I mean, I would say the, you know, the famous emancipation uh, uh, statue of Lincoln with the uh, kneeling slave, which is not unproblematic as a kind of uh, composition, that's a much more kind of interesting iconographic and interesting history too, because it's sponsored by African Americans as well, of which, of which uh, Frederick Douglass even wrote about it as well, as saying that this is unnecessary for this at this point in time, and so on. But he he, he recognized that it was problematic. But he also recognized that it was like actually a step forward in the context of his day. So, let's, so on. yeah, sorry. So go ahead, go ahead. No, I was just saying you have to you have to make these kinds of distinctions. So let's talk about Monument Lab for a second. And I know it's, um, it's, I've been reading so much about Monu Lab, Monument Lab in the, in the past few days, and I'm going to ask you to do something relatively challenging here, which is, can you, can you briefly describe Monument Lab, or, or at least tell me what the goals of the organization are? Sure. Monument Lab is a, well, now it's become a kind of a collector where we study the uh, monumental inventory of a, of a city. It doesn't have to be a city. It could be a rural back, a region or whatever. And then we do a kind of a wholesale analysis in terms of, uh, you know, the power dynamics. Uh, it's it's a kind of it's almost like a board game where we we we, we pinpoint one statue that and then we start uh, pulling out the histories, not just the histories that's that's apparent, but also the histories that are denied that were concurrent with it. The voices, um, the, the the alternative narratives of history that existed. Uh, alongside the dominant history, right? Like we live in a, in a society where there's a dominant narrative becomes naturalized. We think that's that's the narrative, but there's all kinds of other voices, countervailing interpretations of history that's also unfolding at the same moment uh, uh, as the dominant history. Can you right? give, can you give me an example of a, of a of a statue um, either in Philadelphia or otherwise that that you've you've sort of done that you sort of expanded, you sort of pulled on all of the threads around what sure. was going around at the I time? Mean, on a very very early on, when I first moved to uh, Philadelphia, I went to the city hall, and, I, and of course, city hall is the most iconic and most important building for any city. And on the apron of city hall, there's a whole roster of statues. I came upon one of John Wanamaker, who had an eponymously named uh, department store. He was apparently a, kind of a master uh, salesman, and he was the person who invented the sales tag, which you would pin on uh, objects and, and so on. So, and there's a big st bronze statue of him. And I went, wow, okay. I never heard of him at the time. I'm not saying that he didn't deserve uh, memorialization, but I never heard of him. And I, and then um, that same day, uh, I recall, recall visiting, uh, walking past the house where Billie Holiday lived, right? And uh, she then discovered afterwards that she had no statue of her. I'm not saying John Wanamaker didn't deserve uh, recognition, but Billy Holiday sure did. And so when I started looking at the John Wanamaker uh, statue in subsequent visits, I would always see the afterlife or the shadow of Billy Holiday, who's not represented. So that's how we, Monument Lab is always looking at stat statues and markers for what they say, but also trying to tease out what they also don't say or what what is said denies what. Uh, alternative um, narratives to be said. What would you like to see in the monuments of the future? Well, I think one thing is that we should, uh, you know, recognize that monuments ultimately are just nothing but material extracted from the ground, 70% copper of its bronze, and or, or even more actually, 90% copper of its bronze and, and, uh, and marble or whatever, right? But I also think we should start thinking about monuments in much more temporal, provisional uh, sense. That, uh, uh, that we shouldn't over-determine these meanings and we shouldn't certainly read monuments as something that is rooted in a consensus of opinion, right? But that they are very particularized, very subjective, and that they represent very particular power perspectives. And that's, and that's very important to Monument Lab. I know that in doing consultations to see what kind of monuments you'd like to see in a particular city, you, you don't just go to a city council, you go to the people within that community. You often talk to them about the kind of, I mean, I'm, I've heard up to 2,000 respondees per, yeah. per statue to see what they would want to have. Yeah, we do. And we don't, um, we don't also uh, give uh, clues in terms of how they should respond. We just give them extremely open question. 
fundamentally Monument Lab is like a democratic project where we, and people all, at first, many people we ask are at first very skeptical of, of because they see us as part of an establishment or, or whatever. And so um, they are reluctant to, to uh, converse with us. But so we have to work at that. And then at some point after we engender some trust, they are very forthcoming and it's amazing how we, how we in higher circles, elite circles, academic circles, and so on, mm. which I remember, we ignore the wisdom that's uh, furnished by people at the local level at our peril. I, there was a line um, from your organization that really struck me, and I, I wanted to, to, to get your thoughts on it. You said, the next era of monuments should draw attention to the connection between symbols and systems of justice. Could you tell me a bit more about that? Yeah. Because right now, so the, the problematic, the, the discussion about monuments and why many people want them down is because they become symbols of injustice, right? And, and part of the problem with uh, the inventory of monuments that are out there, which are so problematic, is that there's a dearth of countervailing monuments of all kinds of worthy subjects, of all kinds of, you know, just how many Native um, American or how many First Nations or Indigenous statues are there in Canada that's not you know, kind of mythical. That's not, uh, you know, uh, even inaccurate in terms of the in terms of the attire for the region and so on. There's many. I mean, there's one a couple in uh, Philadelphia, and they're of, of plains uh, tribes people, right? And uh, you know, Philadelphia is not on the plains. So it, that's what we mean by a kind of um, reckoning in terms of uh, giving a greater balance and voice to the unheard historically. Well, I'm, I'm, I'm glad you brought Canada up because I think that Canada has a tendency to, I mean, you as a Canadian know this, has a tendency to sometimes look smugly south of the border and kind of and shake our heads and sort of pat ourselves on the, on the back. But do you think Canada is doing enough to, to reckon with the historical narrative that our monuments put forward? No, I don't think they. I don't think Canada's doing enough, right? I mean, I think Canada's a better place than in, in America, right? But that doesn't mean that Canada is 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 a paragon of virtue. I mean, I I see uh, has there been any real advancement uh, since the uh, Stephen Harper's apology about um, reconciliation in terms of residential schools? I mean, you know, that's that's a very simple question. What has been the progress, real progress, in terms of First Nations and Indigenous? people's treatment since that moment. I would say, I would submit not that much. I want to go back to something you said earlier when you talked about the idea that this is this is just a bunch of copper in some ways, and we put a lot of meaning into these statues. And, you know, one of the things that I really enjoyed about reading what you were working on is the idea that, that monuments and statues don't represent a time that's immovable in our history, but they can represent a continuum, a marking around the long line of history. And as our history progresses, we get new statues, we get new monuments. As an artist, though, and someone who makes public art yourself, and last time I spoke to you, I was talking about your, your yeah. monument that was going up in Vancouver. You have to accept then, and maybe this is a bit egocentric, as an artist that your work may not last forever. How, how comfortable are you with that? Uh, I'm very comfortable. I mean, I'm more comfortable with uh, people understanding that I am truly uh, trying to express something of my time, and, and, and uh, hopefully that um, people appreciate that and feel it's worthy to be kept and maintained over time. But I, I have no control over that. I mean, that's, that's the nature of um, uh, putting things in public, public context. That's good. That's good. Like, I guess that's good mindfulness. <laughs> like, that's good, you know, to not, to not try and hold on to, your, to yourself. I understand what you mean by that. Um, Ken, do you think there's a, are you optimistic that we can create monuments that might bring people together? I think we can. I, I think, first of all, I do think there is a role for monuments, right? Because because there are um, all kinds of subjects that deserve to be remembered. There are subjects that unify people in, in a very broad sense, and that are um, uh, central to to uh, to to a, a nation's kind of uh, uh, the best of a nation, for example, right? And so I, I'm. I, they continue, and there are good. Uh, monuments are being created all the time. I think the Vietnam Veterans Memorial is really kind of an amazing uh, monument. I think the uh, you know Jewish Library by Rachel Whiteread in, in Vienna is kind of an amazing 
uh, uh, piece. So they, they do occur over and over again. So I'm not saying categorically that there sh shouldn't be, right? But I do think it starts with um, dialogue and it starts with public input and it starts with uh, it's, it, it's systemic change in terms of uh, a broader and deeper appreciation of, of histories, particularly the histories of the, of, of the voiceless, the histories of the poor, the histories of the oppressed, the histories of people of, who are maltreated because of their difference. Ken Lum, we're such big fans of you here. Thanks for making the time to talk to us, and I hope you get back to Canada soon. I hope so, too. Thanks a lot for talking to me, Tom. <laughs>